from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snow. Thank you for downloading my educational fly fishing podcast, even though this episode is not necessarily about fly fishing. This is episode 294 with Chris Campo, and it's brought to you by Corkers. Please excuse the helicopter and C-130 military planes flying over while we're doing the podcast. I do live in the DC metro area, and it's been a very busy week with inauguration. When I get a text about somebody catching a big fish in the DC area, it's usually gonna be Chris Campo's picture and a huge fish. Chris is a VCU or Virginia Commonwealth University graduate. He majored in environmental studies with a minor in biology. He is a district angling ambassador and a fish and wildlife biologist for the fisheries and wildlife division in the Department of Energy and Environment for Washington, DC. Chris stopped by the back porch recently for a conversation about who he is and how he catches so many big fish in our local waters. The Corkers brand was born 60 years ago on the treacherous banks of the Rogue River in Oregon. The original river cleat was handmade out of rubber and spikes. The functional design quickly grew as a favorite among fishermen, and the rest is history. Through the years, Corkers has continued to innovate with purpose, bringing advancements to fishing footwear, interchangeable soles, boa lacing, and internal drainage are just a few wading boot firsts brought to you by the passionate folks at Corkers. Check out my favorite, the Devil's Canyons, and their latest products at corkers.com or go to your local Corkers dealers. Corkers.com, helping you expand the boundaries of your outdoor adventures. Episode 294. So we've got Chris Campo here. You want to say hi? How's it going, guys? Rob, thank you for having me. Yeah, so I've been wanting to do this for years. I always thought Nick would join us. I've never actually met Nick before. In person? Yeah. Really? He's just a Facebook persona. He's down in uh, the Tidewater area now, but I'm sure one day we could uh, get him on here, perhaps. Right on. All right, we're going to find out who you are. I consider you the DC's most accomplished angler. Big fish everywhere all the time, at least on your Instagram. (laughs) Don't let that, don't give us a like Instagram versus reality. I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware of the uh, the highlight reel effect there. That's a bit of a stretch. I wouldn't say I'm the best. I mean, I, I certainly put in a lot of time, and I think that that helps quite a bit. But like you like you said, I mean, when you see social media, you are kind of seeing the highlight right. reel. Um, you're not seeing the skunks. You're just seeing sort of the the results. And no um, wife, no kid. So no, no, I'm, I'm I'm 24, so I'm, I'm pretty young still. I'm sure at some point. All right. Do you have a celebrity doppelganger that listeners can picture you? I do not. No, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Does your hair actually grow? This is probably, right now, what you're seeing, obviously the, the listeners can't see this. Okay, uh, similar now. Yeah, what, what, you're, what you're seeing is probably the longest it's been in a long time. Right. I've always kept it uh, generally high and tight until uh, March of this Every year. Every picture, it's like, you always got a buzz cut, so I just wanted to know. It could have just been like, that's as far as your hair grows. You can no, no, it, it does It does indeed grow, and uh, I'm sure it'll keep growing if I don't cut it sometime soon. See, we didn't, you, you don't know about a Floby, do you? No, I have so, no idea what that is. So Floby was probably 91, 92, commercial. You buy it on TV. It was a hair cutter built on your vacuum cleaner. Okay. So the vacuum cleaner sucked, the blades went back and forth, and it would suck all the hair into the vacuum cleaner. Huh. The Floby. If they had those now, I mean, last year they would have made a fortune. That is a... Uh, and you would just change the guards on it and yeah. you cut hair and there was no mess. I, I've been doing some at-home haircuts, not with the yeah. Floby, unfortunately. Yeah, I cut my own hair. All right, so where are you from? Where'd you grow up? So I was actually born in Connecticut. I only lived there for the first two years of my life. I have no memory of it whatsoever. I've lived in the, like, sort of Vienna Tyson's area since 1998. So right. Cool. Uh, James Madison High School in okay. Vienna. So where'd you grow up in here? Like what, what, what street were you on? Where in that area were you? Um, I'm from Reston. Okay, yeah. So sort of the edge of Vienna as it approaches Tyson's. Okay. Um, you know, over the past decade or so, you can sort of see the skyline finally coming up. There. Yes. Towards like um, the golf course? Yeah. Yeah, I actually worked there. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, we grew up going to that Anita's, the two-story one, quite often. And you have been to the Vienna Inn for Chili Dogs? 
Many a time. Yeah, many a time. It's awesome. My neighbor's never been. I don't understand that. When did you get into fishing growing up? Potomac wasn't too far. You had a golf course where you worked. So I, I did work at at, uh, at Westwood. Yep, growing up. Interestingly, fishing for me, I always I always did have an interest, and in, in, in sort of in the, the general aquatic world. In terms of actually getting into fishing, it was probably right around age twelve or so. I mean, sure, my dad took me for bluegills as a kid and all that, right? But I, I would say right around age 12, 13. I had a pretty bad sports injury when I was younger, and that kind of ended a lot of a lot of the contact sports for me. So, interestingly, I kind of pivoted towards fishing of all things, and it, it stuck. And I really, really got into that. You may know Ernie Rojas. Yeah. Right? So my dad actually worked with him. He was okay. a, a huge influence in that. He's known me my entire life, so I, I would say Ernie was probably one of, if not the biggest, like fishing influence uh, growing up. And and again, you know, for, from age like twelve or thirteen, it just it became like an addiction. Every time I saw water in my mind, I'm like, how can I fish that? What's in there? And it just, I mean, it, it is, it is an addicting hobby slash sport, but it's it's a productive one. I mean, I love it. I think we all do. That's why we're here. But, Did you ever used to go into Orvis and Tyson's when you were little? Not when I was little. Um, so I would have remembered you. No, no. I, I really, it's it's sort of interesting. Here I am on a fly fishing uh, podcast, and I, I'm not not the best fly angler. I really don't specialize in it. But I, I did go into Orvis Tyson's Corner later later on, you know, in the, in the past few years. And I, I got to know, like, Ryan. Yeah. Was, do you ever go to the old location on the other side of the street? I don't the little believe one. so. It was, like, the size of a closet. Okay. No, I don't think I ever went okay. to that one, no. That's, that was where I was working way back in the Okay. Day long time ago. What do you do when you're not fishing? That's a great question. I get that a lot. Think about fishing. No, <laughs> I, I really, unfortunately, up, up, up until about uh, March of 2020, I was, I was really into weightlifting and I kind of took a step back from that when the gyms closed down and I haven't really gotten back into that. So that's something obviously in 2021, I'm looking to do more of. I hear about someone inside that window right there. <laughs> mad that the gym Right. I, I'm sure everyone kind of feels that way though. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, stuff like that, you know, it's sort of like right now as, as I've entered into, into work at DOE, it's like my life has sort of become fishing in a way, right? I mean, I, I coordinate fishing events for DOEE and then on like a personal level, I fish all the time. So that's, that's pretty interesting. I, I love it though. I mean, I get, I get paid to do what I, what I enjoy. So you have really snake heads and tanks where you work? Uh, we do have one at the ARAC. Yes. That's pretty cool. We'll get into all of that later. Okay. All right, so uh, I want to know how to catch big fish, methods you use. Tell us what it is that you do, because there are a probably non-fly anglers that listen, but okay. us fly anglers can listen and learn and, and try to use your information to help us in our pursuits. Definitely. When it comes to any new species that I'm targeting, right? I mean, it could be anything from, from gar to flatheads, you know, snakeheads, so on and so forth, right? Most Mostly the local-ish freshwater species native and non-native, I try to learn everything I can about the species, right? So what does it primarily feed upon? You know, is, is it active during the day, at night? Just little things like that. Um, learning, obviously, how to fish certain tides helps too and how certain fish feed on certain tides. You know, you really, you can just break it down and break it down and break it down. But I, I think part of it too is just fishing, keeping a log book, um, keeping notes, right? And then sort of applying what you learn every time you go out. I mean, you, you should learn something, whether you catch fish or not, you should learn something every time. Uh, I know that sounds probably terribly preachy, but I, I think there's some truth to that. So definitely, I, I would say the most important thing is keep a log book. Um, and, and that can be anything from in tidal rivers, right? Like tides, water temperature, air temperature, barometric pressure, it just goes on and on and on. Um, moon phase, right? which obviously is related to tide, but all of those things sort of go into the calculus of catching any species. I mean, it, it could be bluegill fishing, right? It could be anything, but you do have to sort of take into account a lot of those factors in whatever species you're targeting. Um, so that, that's sort of the mental calculus that goes through my mind when what I do target you use anything to, in particular. What's your preferred tide preference to learn, like preferred app? online what do you use for your tides um I, I will just use i mean frankly there are so many of them off the top of my head i can think of like saltwater tides as one mobile geographics i believe is another i don't think the app or the the site matters too much generally they're pretty in sync mm -hmm. um, but obviously you want to pick the right tide chart for the right time right location i mean if you pick the wrong one that might <laughs> might not work out too well yeah so i was out with a client and we were going up to cape cod so my Tide chart was set for Chatham. Okay. 
So I booked a client thinking we were going to be at dead low tide, but it was dead low tide at Chatham. Right. And we ended up just getting completely flooded out where we were waiting up at four mile run. I was okay. like, yeah, I don't know what's going on today. But yeah, I screwed that one up. Yeah, that'll uh, that'll do it. Uh, another thing too, of course, is like understanding, especially in this area, in the DC area. I mean, if you have a northwest wind all day, chances are the tide is just going to be blown out. I mean, to the point where if it's strong enough for long enough, right, it'll pretty much cancel an incoming too. So mm -hmm. that that's something for local anglers sort of to keep in mind, uh, especially in the DC area, those northwest winds. Yeah, I could. We used to have bamboo back here, and if that stuff was swaying. I was just, there was no point of going out. Watch that, watch the house flag. Yeah. We're gonna have to look at the, the weather channel to find out what's gonna be that day, I just know. But that's when I go exploring. When the water's all blown out, Definitely. go walk around Roaches Run. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing is, even when the river is blown out, you can always, generally, especially with all the warm water discharges and things like that, and as you well know, like you can find clear water. You do just have to look around a little bit. And, and, and smaller watersheds, right? So like, for example, even the Anacostia relative to sort of the main stem Potomac, like it's a smaller watershed, so it'll blow out really quickly, but it'll also come down really quickly. Same for like smaller tributaries, right, of the Potomac or, or of other rivers in general, right? Like if you have a smaller area, generally speaking, that, you know, that creek or that tributary, whatever it might be, will probably clear out faster than the main stem river. Have you been noticing we have way more flash floods and stream erosion on the banks in the last couple of years like four mile run you used to have to climb down three to four feet to get to the water now you just walk right in i haven't so i haven't really fished oh, so yeah uh, four mile run has definitely received some pretty serious flash flooding uh, on multiple events over the past four or five years um, i can't speak for four miles specifically just because I, I really don't fish it too much um, i did when i was younger awesome spot it leaves the fish for us but <laughs> but uh, I, I will say i mean when and this is just in general right when you pave over a watershed uh, wherever that might be you have all these impervious surfaces right the water is not it's not percolating it's not getting down into the water table it's just, it's just run it's surface runoff right it's going to go right into those smaller streams blow them out i mean even anywhere around here you go into any local neighborhood stream and chances are it's pretty degraded right so when you combine all of those, right, flowing into, for example, four mile run, right, and then into the river, and you extrapolate that to all the different, I mean, it's, there's a reason that the river gets blown out pretty epically at times. The last couple of days in the Pacific Northwest, I think they're saying the amount of rain falling in a day or per hour is enough to fill 170,000 Olympic sized pools. I believe it. I really do. I can imagine what that's doing up there. Yeah, I mean, luckily, you're talking about the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. I would say they definitely have a lot more forest, maybe not, necess it. not necessarily old growth. I mean, there really isn't much of that left in this country, but forest in general, right around here, I mean, it's so fragmented, so paved over. Um, I think that's really the main reason you just see these epic blowouts right. in a lot of our tributaries. And it doesn't snow anymore. We just get winter rainstorms. Yeah, I can't remember. I'm trying to think. It was probably... It's probably about 10 years ago, the last time we really had like an epic, epic uh, snowstorm around here. Yeah, the three blizzards in a row were awesome. Yeah. And then we had that one blizzard in 2016, 2015. I think we had like one or two moderate ones in between. Yeah, but... we got 27. Our neighbor's like, uh, he goes by Alan Thunderstorm hmm. on his email. We don't really know his real name. But he said we we're going to get 27 inches of snow in this neighborhood. And my yardstick had 27. Wow. Spot was, on. Yeah, it was nuts. Um, yeah, it just we just get so much. I, I just the small streams I fish, I definitely have seen a lot of detrimental effects from all the flash floods. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, they're they're pretty. I mean, literally anyone around here that I can think of is probably pretty severely eroded relative to whatever sort of like ancestral state yeah. it was in. Um, but that's sort of that comes with the territory, right? I mean, we live in a highly or, or rather a densely populated area, so it's. Not too surprising, but it's maybe not ideal. But they really didn't plan on where water would go. So I grew up in Reston, okay. where the water was all planned to go into the lakes. Right, right. And then from there, it would trickle through the top of the dam to a tailwater. Right. Sol problem solved. But out here, there was just, just sent it to this, you know, downhill. Yeah. For what it's worth, Reston was actually relatively well planned, as far as I know. Um, but yeah, like you said, in this area, in general, I mean, storm water is just going wherever, whenever.
and it washes all the garbage down with it. Definitely. Yeah, man. Uh, so how do you prepare for one of these trips? You got all that stuff dialed in, barometric pressure for the day, wind, tides. Pressure is not one that I look at too much. I mean, it's sort of, it's, you do, you know, take it into account. You know, I, I really tend to pack lightly for whatever species I'm targeting, right? So I might say I'm going after like snakeheads in the kayak, right? I'll probably have a tackle box. And again, I know your listeners can't see this, maybe, you know, yeah, big, right? So like, like a single tackle box with, yeah. with the tackle that I'm fairly confident will work. And that's usually it. And, and the same is true for almost anything I target. I don't believe in, you see guys with the whole tackle bags and everything. And I, I tend to think you can go overkill. You should have a good idea of what you're going to use going into it and then use that tackle, generally speaking. I mean, you, it's it's really easy to overpack and I'm, I'm really big into like efficient trip planning. So, I mean, for me, I've got the same old, gosh, it's probably six or eight years old. It's a, it's falling apart now. It's an REI bag, right? It's a little tiny one, like a day pack. And usually like it's mostly taken up with water, right? So a couple water bottles, reusable water bottles, and then maybe a tackle box. And that's like my trip bag from shore nice and, easy. Um, and I'll use like in my kayak right I mean <laughs> I actually fish out of Ernie's old ocean kayak believe it or not that thing's ancient that was my next question is what do you what kind of kayak do you have so I'm pretty uh <laughs> I've got a pretty archaic kayak it's a 2005 ocean kayak it's a prowler angler 13 I mean it's ancient but it floats yeah it floats I really like um you know it's, it's not one that I'm gonna stand in it's, it was not designed for that it's got a great hole design really good for saltwater fishing or freshwater for that matter um really cuts through the water it's a fast kayak i'll probably upgrade to a hobie i mean a, a hobie at some point most people are doing that i just have not gotten around to it yet that is my sort of day-to-day -day kayak when so i do with kayak fish the simplicity of your fishing you're not that guy with eight rods sticking off the back and four milk jugs full of stuff yeah I'll, I'll use a milk crate that i right. kind of like you know i'll attach it with a carabiner into the back of my kayak but yeah i mean I, you'll see a water bottle a tackle box pretty simple That's there's about some it. dudes that have it must take them 10 minutes to load their kayaks up right there's so much crap on them you yep. tip over you yeah got a yeah. lot of stuff to deal with that's uh that's sort of a whole other topic like sort of kayak safety and everything right but and obviously you don't want to <laughs> you don't want to be imbalanced and tip over or anything like that especially in the colder months but, yeah, again, I'm definitely a minimalist, I, I would say, when it comes to like trip planning, like what I bring. I mean, I bring the right things, generally speaking, but um, I'm not bringing much because that, that can sort of get in the way. Like you said, you know, you see a guy with eight rods and a, maybe he's got a cooler and who knows what else. So and, much. Yeah, um, let's it's, go it's, through. It's overkill. So what do you throw for snakeheads? Frogs? That's sort of what everyone thinks. I'm not really spilling any secrets at this point. Most, yeah, gosh, snakehead fishing is huge now more so than ever before. Frogs work great, hollow body frogs, soft plastic frogs, all that. I generally think the smaller, the better. And that's not always the case, but I, I do think in terms of just getting it in their mouth, maybe a smaller frog is gonna help if you're fishing top water. In terms of subsurface lures, flukes work pretty well, um, like a Texas rig, weedless fluke, that does work pretty well. Chatterbaits are another huge one. I mean, frogs and chatterbaits, those would argu arguably be the top two. But that's not to say that those are the only lures. I mean, th there's a saying amongst local fishermen, right? If you want to catch a snakehead, just go bass fishing. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, even if you're not targeting them, uh, they're the probably, th exactly. They're, they're probably holding in the same general areas. Yeah, but but in general, I mean, I would say almost all of the snakeheads I've caught, I would say are on frogs, chatterbaits, actually in some cases, just like traditional bass jigs too. Uh, working working them a little bit more slowly in like cooler water. Um, you ever eat them? I have. I love them. They're great. Excellent table fare. Don't eat every one I catch, but I, I do harvest them from time to time. The and wife just she just knows what they look like. She won't eat them. Yeah, they are. Not that other fish are that pleasant looking. Right, right. Snakeheads, I, I, I think you're cool looking. I think snakeheads scare some people. Not not surprisingly, right? I mean, there's been so much hype about northern snakeheads, especially like early on. Even I remember that, and that was when I was much younger. But also, too, I mean, when you when you catch a snakehead, they are the slimiest fish. I mean, they're still a scaled fish, but if you, like, catch one, bring it out of the water, and hold it up, I mean, they it's are just mucusy. dripping. Exactly. They're, they're dripping sort of that, that really thick mucusy slime, and that's that's not great. I think that turns a lot of people off. That's why we got to carry trash bags if we're taking them home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, cooler trash bags, something right. like that. But, yeah, you don't want to just have them out. They're going to make a mess. Do you ever gut them to see what they're eating, the ones that you do take home? 
you know, I honestly can't say I've done it in the kitchen. I, I will say some of the bigger, actually this year alone, some of the bigger snakeheads that I saw caught, I mean, <laughs> Sometimes you, uh, sometimes you catch them, sometimes you're the cameraman, right? Some of the bigger ones I saw caught uh, spat up bluegills and large ones too. So I, I'm a firm believer, you know, obviously everyone says killifish, right? If you read Odenkirk's papers, I mean, that's generally the case. Killifish, um, centricids, right? So like sunfish in general. And then actually, believe it or not, white perch. Supposedly they eat quite a lot of white perch too. There. Something my father-in-law has in common with the snakehead. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and I can actually say too, I mean, I've, I've caught bullseye snakeheads too in South Florida, and I remember distinctly I caught, this was, I was on some golf course of, you know, nine or 10 at night, and I, I catch a five pound snakehead and it pukes up a bluegill. So I do think they're eating a lot of, and, and not just bluegills, but you know, pumpkin Whatever seeds. Whatever yeah, Exactly, any any sort of sunfish, definitely killifish, just because they're so abundant, yeah. they're everywhere. Um, and, and surely white perch too, probably in the spring, I would imagine. We didn't catch any white perch last year i don't think a single one at fletcher's or anywhere okay that's any, any spots we were out i only fished chain bridge area okay three or four times but i don't think we caught any you know like fredericksburg hmm. maybe i could no, i caught some fredericksburg but like all through the summer not any gravelly yeah i catch you think in the tidal basin actually yeah speaking of the tidal basin I, I did catch some pretty nice ones in the tidal basin this year white perch interestingly too so we did do a few in-person clinics, um, fishing clinics this summer on the Anacostia, late summer. And on a moving tide, a lot of the kids would catch like simple bottom rig, right? Like a high-low rig. We were catching good numbers of sort of the three, four, five-inch white perch. So I, I think they're around. I don't, I can't really say I target them. If I am, it's probably to keep a few to eat. And I really just don't do that too often. Um, they're great when you got to put clients on fish. Oh yeah. Something I mean, else is inviting. Exactly. I mean. I call them consolation fish. Yep. Yep. Just, Tap your rod up and down, jig it at the bottom of the boat. And yeah, I, I can't up. say I caught many this year either, although I really wasn't trying for them. In 2019, I did catch some pretty nice ones. There were a few days where I just specifically brought out the perch rods and did all right on them. Because we had a very heavy rainfall last year. So I don't know if it was just wasn't brackish enough. They went back to the bay early. Yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there are fish that around here, as far as I know, and the, the best the, the best two persons to talk to would be, of course, like Gordon and Paula, right, at Fletcher's. But as far as I know, they, they push up white perch mid mid to, I'd say, the second to third week of March, generally speaking. So there is a chance they might just come up, spawn, and, and take on, on. At, le at least the larger, the larger right. fish. What are you going to throw for gar? For gar? This is going to be disappointing to your fly fishing fans, but honestly, bait is often the best. So I learned this from some anglers. Uh, down south when I went to school at VCU, actually, and they would fish for them, basically. And I, and actually, another person, Pat Kerwin, too, who I'm sure you've have, have you met Pat by any chance? No, no. Okay, so he's he's a really highly skilled multi-species fisherman around here. He's pretty active in some of the local groups. Usually, Pat, if anyone's a beer tie, I'm busy time. Right, right. That's why I can never sit down and ask you questions. Get you out here. <laughs> hey, we're finally here. In in short, the most effective way. Um, everyone talks about like rope flies and rope lures, and you might catch them incidentally on other bass lures too. But generally speaking, a small, you know, like a cigar float, right? Um, maybe. 24 to 36 inches of leader, probably 20 pound floral or greater. Small, small, but very sharp hook. And then either a chunk of fresh cut bait, it could be perch or bluegill, or just like a live minnow. That, that, and, and frankly, you can even use a whole live bluegill, but they will swallow it. And that's maybe not great for the fish in terms of its release chances. Yeah, generally some sort of live or fresh cut bait under a bobber. Um, that would be probably the go-to. I, I really haven't so now I kind of want to just leave a Clouser minnow under a indicator. You know, honestly, if there were some degree of scent to it, I mean, it, it would be <laughs> it's probably sacrilege in terms of fly fishing, but I could see, I mean, they're a very curious fish. Gar will follow all the way to your feet. I mean, even yeah, if you're in a that's big, where we get our exactly. roaches run is when we're going to roll cast, the Clouser's right next to my shin and you have a four foot long fish, just grab it and snap the leader before we even know what goes on. Yeah, it's one of those things I, I would say with gar, even if you, because of their bony mouth, right? Even if you do get bit, even if you have the right pound test leader, all of that, you might not get the actual hook penetration. Um, That's a bony rostrum. Exactly. So, I mean, 
you, you can fish for dog laughing next door. <laughs> you you can fish for them. It, it is fun. I, you know, I, I used to do it probably more so than I used to actually fish for them with with uh, Nick quite a bit locally. I just haven't done it as much anymore. I mean, again, you can only catch so many of them before it's like okay, you know, they they really don't they don't fight too hard. Honestly, um, once you turn them, they come right in. So they might give you a couple runs if they're actually facing away from you, but assuming you've hooked it, you've done everything right, like once you actually turn that fish, even if it's a bigger fish, generally they're going to come in relatively easily. How do you handle them? I've gotten cut up pretty bad. Um, gosh, this is probably not the the best way to do it. And you're that. doing it in a kayak too sometimes, right? Sometimes, yeah. I usually just grab them by the snout. I mean, they do cut you. There's really no other way to do it. Even their their scales are just That's so... what I'm saying, the scales. Like, I used to carry garden gloves with me. Yeah, I mean, that, that would probably be a great way to go about it. Honestly... You know, for for the longest time, whether it was whether it was gar or even like larger catfish, I would just grab them, and you know they're gonna cut you up, they're gonna chew you up. But that that I like to do it that way, just because you're sort of in control. But it's maybe not the best way to do yeah. it. So let's go into catfish then. Yeah, yeah. So well, locally, those big blue ones are just gross. Like you can, they just smell. They do. They really do smell bad. Um, gross creature. Yeah, we. I mean, gosh. Because if you're eating gizzard shads, like. Yeah, exactly. The smell there. comes out of you. Like okay. if you drink too much whiskey or eat too much garlic, the next day you smell. Yeah, same same concept. I mean, gosh, we've all intentionally or not caught our fair share of blue catfish. I mean, anyone that fishes the tidal Potomac, again, whether or not they're targeting blue catfish, has caught a blue catfish. I mean, I've caught them on bass lures. I've caught them on striper lures. I mean, you name it. Right? Yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll even people do catch them on on top water presentations. I mean, they hit everything. Like that's a byproduct of their abundance, right? In terms of like my fishing for them, I don't do it as much anymore unless I'm maybe like taking some kids out. It's a nice, fun, easy thing to do. I really, gosh, I would say starting like late high school and then and then kind of through parts of college, like I would fish for them um, on the James and also on the Potomac, usually springtime. That's kind of the easiest time to catch a big one, like a truly big one. Definitely caught a lot of good ones. Good meaning like 30 plus pounds up, up to about 50 or so and, and occasionally one or two maybe greater than that um from the kayak so that that was a ton of fun drift fishing for them are they deep um deep is sort of a relative term i mean when you're fishing for them in the spring around fletchers there are some holes that are sort of in that 50 foot range you know 30 to 50 feet and, and some greater and again all you're really doing i mean it's it's simple simple fishing it's almost I'm sure I'm sure your fly fishing uh, listeners might not care too much, but you know you're really just dropping down a large, a large chunk of either fresh cut or, or live bait. You know, hitting bottom right, reeling up a couple turns, and you're just drifting and sort of contouring the bottom. And those fish, I mean, they slam it. It's a pretty simple, and, and but it's it's good fun. I mean, especially when you do end up with like a forty or fifty pound fish. Yeah, I remember Remick was doing it with 30-foot leaders and a quarter-ounce jig. Right, right. And those things were just disgusting. He's a big dude. Yeah. yeah he's a, and to look at the, ugh, they're fun. But I, I've never experienced the size you guys catch. We get like 18 to 20s. Yeah. None yeah. of those that are, you know, could you could put my pants on them that wide. Definitely, yeah. I mean, I, I think for the truly larger fish, and gosh, the, the hardcore cat fishermen might actually laugh at me for saying like 50 is large because there are guys that do catch like, you know, 50 to 70, even 80 plus pound fish. I'm sure. Do you remember uh, Jason Kintner by any chance? Yeah. He ran capital catfishing. You may have seen his boat yeah, around. Yeah. Um, no relation to the Kintner boy? Not that I know of, no. Got so, one that got eaten on July 4th by, by the Great White. No, no. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't even hear about that. Jaws. Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. I had no That's idea. That's the kid that gets eaten on the beach. Gotcha. Well, I need to <laughs> fresh. Yeah, up I've seen on that boat movie, before. <laughs> movie tri- uh, trivia there. No, so, so Jason. Again, going a little off tangent, but yeah, he um, he was sort of like the premier local guide for them. And, and I know he would put fish every year up to 80 pounds or so wow. on the boat locally. Too. He's I mean, like the only just big charter head boat that's doing that, right? I've only, when I've taken my boat up to Fletcher's, he's the only boat I ever see out with just rods sticking out of. Yep. So he, he, he was definitely the big one. He's out of the area right now. I think he's planning to come back in 2021, 2022. I'm not quite sure. There are like one or two other guides that actually, like, like truly official guides that do target them in DC. But that's really about it. I mean, most of the anglers targeting, and we do have obviously a large trophy blue catfish population, most of the individuals targeting them are just like recreational anglers. Uh, they might have nice boats and everything, nice gear, but they're usually not like guided trips, generally mm-hmm. speaking. Do you ever kill the big ones? I, it's, I feel guilty throwing them back. 
but I can't just kill something, bash it on the head just because it right, doesn't belong. Right. I, you know, I'd be lying if I said I haven't killed some, but the truth is at this point, I mean, the numbers, everything I've heard sort of 70 to 80% of the resident fish biomass is blue catfish, right? So even if you do kill one, I don't know if it makes much of a difference. You know, we probably, sh should we be killing? Yeah, we probably should be. But again, uh, I've been in situations where I've been paddling and, and they're actually, they're omnivorous too. So, I mean, they do eat vegetation too, interestingly. And, and I, I've been paddling like at night on a higher tide over like hydrilla fields. And you just, you look around with your headlight, you turn your headlamp on, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of, you know, sort, sort of like 10, 12 pound. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, th th when I say they're everywhere, they're sort of like carp. They're just everywhere. Mm -hmm. And like, sure, again, could you, could you kill a, 30, 40 pound fish. Yeah, you could. Would it make a difference? I tend to think not. Again, it's sort of like what you, what you should do and sort of what you can do about it. And, and I don't think it'll make much of a dent. Unfortunately, I mean, I, I wish, right. I wish they'd go away, but I don't think they will be anytime soon. Save for flatheads. Have you seen more of those as a recent addition to the river? So it's really interesting in my and, and my frame of reference, of course, is smaller just because I'm younger. Right. In my experience, their population does seem to have sort of popped off in the last maybe five or so years. As far as I know, they were introduced into the Occoquan Reservoir in the, in the mid to late sixties. So chances are that, you know, they probably at some point went over the dam or were illegally stocked otherwise in the tidal Potomac. So chances are they've, they've been around for quite some time. If I had to guess right now, they're found throughout much of the tidal river. And actually they're, they're seeing quite a few of them all the way up to about dam five or so, maybe even above that. Do they so, eat the same thing as everything else will? Yeah, so, so flathead catfish are arguably are, are, are worse than even blue catfish um, in the sense that they're they're apex piscivores. So they, they eat other fish. And generally speaking, most people that target them are using live bait. So, you know, when you when you think of like a flathead catfish in like DC in the spring, I mean it's in hog heaven, right? You know, it's 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 going to be eating shad and herring and perch and probably anything else that little that will fit in its mouth. So yeah, I would say they're probably as big of a problem, if not bigger of a problem than, than even blue catfish. I just don't think they're as abundant maybe yet. So that's sort of the difference. Right. Okay. What about smallmouth? Oh gosh, that's a tough one to talk about. You know, even in the past few years, it seems, and it perhaps might be related to flat-eyed catfish. It's hard to say for sure. It, it, it feels, and then I think many local anglers would agree it feels like our, our local smallmouth bass population has definitely dropped off. So sort of like from Seneca on down, I mean, mm -hmm. sure there are fish, no one's going to say there are not, but the abundance uh, in, into Tidewater, I, I wouldn't say is what it was at all. Um, sort of a sore topic. I mean, even like if you were to talk to like Alex Binstead, for example, and a few other anglers, some of the old timers, you know, they would tell you that there was a pretty consistent fishery, even, you know, four or five years ago. And it seems post 2018, I'm sure you remember those floods. Yeah. One after another, right? We it, used to get huge ones during the shad run. If you were throwing a clouser minnow. Occasionally, if you timed it right, yeah, you, you could really get into them. And it, again, there still are some fish around. I, I happened, you know, I only caught a handful of smallmouth this year on the tidal Potomac. And two of them were very nice fish, but they were very few and very far between. I wouldn't, I would not call it a, uh, like a consistent fishery, at least anymore. My biggest um, smallmouth in my life is four mile run. Really? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think I've, gosh, I think I've seen one caught in there. I'm sure they go in there from time to time. We used to we'll get them every once in a while. Yeah. But yeah, I yeah. was just, it was dark water. And I was just, this is how you fish a woolly bugger. And this mouth just came up and grabbed it. Really? I was like, sorry. It was 98 degrees that day too. Wow. Okay. So I had two four hour trips. Huh. And I was wearing waders and it was just brutal. Interestingly, I will say this, this, this is sort of a, a different topic from just smallmouth necessarily. The, a lot of our like quote unquote warm water discharges actually put off cooler water. So you were talking about a 98 degree yeah, day. Yeah, oh, it was, um, I like to sit in that with waders in the summer. Right, right, so, so that water actually will 60. hold pretty nice fish uh, in, in the dead of summer. So dead of winter, right, you have cold air temps and then actually very warm water. And then dead of summer, you have very warm air temperatures and actually pretty cool water relative. Oxygenated too. Exactly. Re but relative to sort of that kind of warmer, generally more stagnant, you know, water in like the main stem river. So. I saw something three weeks ago at the outflow for a mile. I would have said it was a sheep's head. Hmm. Black and white vertical bands. It's a bit bigger than a bluegill. 
perhaps a tilapia of some sort. So, and it, it came up to the fly, and I was just, client was like, what's that? I'm like, I, I don't know. Yeah, if I had to guess, I mean, not that they're exactly doppelgangers, right? right. But I, I would say, yeah, I mean, you've seen tilapia in there. Tilapia, I've seen rainbow trout. Yeah, yeah, I mean. Ornamental carp. Yeah, there are plenty of those, too. You never know what's in there. Exactly. I mean, you, you just don't know. People around here do tend to sort of dump their pets. So. Yeah, if you want two goldfish. So I was up at the Latour last month, and I grabbed a handful of aquatic plants hmm. to put in my aquarium, and it's all gone within less than a month. Wow. Those goldfish have eaten everything. Wow. I hate them. Yeah, goldfish and then common carp in general are, are definitely, I mean, you don't think of them as like a, an invasive, but they really, they are, they do. Horrible for the environment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, when they're mudding, they're feeding on the bottom, they're rooting around through all that vegetation. They're not, they're not good news for water quality, um, but I don't think anyone's, anyone's surprised by that. Have you ever caught a goldfish on the river? I'm trying to think. Goldfish, um, I have caught a few, um, and, and, and carp too, actually, on, on artificials. So just like small, usually like when I'm crappy fishing, you'll kind of stumble upon them in the spring. Um, I found that carp and goldfish both will, you know, they'll, they'll sort of eat artificials generally in the springtime for whatever reason, kind of like minnow imitations. Yeah, we'll get them on nymphs in the spring when they're spawning. Yeah. We'll get one that'll just peel off and see something and grab it and they go try to chase the female again. There was one time, I want to say I was in Roach's Run, and I came upon literally a school of probably like half pound to maybe one or two pound goldfish. Now, not all of them were, you know, gold. Some of them were sort of that black blackish. And white, yeah, black exactly. And exactly. But they're, yeah, I mean, they're abundant in addition to sort of common carp, too. So I need to fish that more with my water master. My water master's got a trolling motor. Really? Yes. I've okay. got only one with a trolling motor that's ever been. It's totally jerry rigged. Huh. So it's got a 30, 30 thrust. It's pretty sweet. Awesome. So I don't have to row through there. Right, right. Uh, what else? What are we else? Uh, shad fishing. Um, shad darts. Gosh, uh, what what about them? <laughs> They're easy. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, shad fishing. It's once the you, least once, technical fishing you'll ever find. Exactly. Yeah. Once you sort of have the right gear down. Basically, listen to whatever Alex Binstead or Mike Bailey say about that. But uh, yeah, generally speaking, once you have the right gear down, you know, I'm not a huge believer in like color necessarily. I'm sure you've heard that a million times on this podcast, right? The best advice I ever received was from, I want to say it was Alex and his, his dad, Mark, Mark Binstead. They both recommend, um, you know, actually painting or even using Sharpie, just like a little black uh, paint, right? Or, or coloration on your shad darts for contrast. That's usually the best thing you can do, but I mean, all the typical colors, right? You know, pink, green, white, and others too. I mean, yeah, I've, just, I've used purple, blue, orange. They all tend to work. So uh, yeah, that's, that's about all I can really say that's even remotely original on shad fishing, so. Anything about bass fishing we'd be surprised to learn? Around here or just in general? In general. Or, um, I do actually do it. I, I used to do it, maybe not as much anymore. I do enjoy night fishing for them. I mean, you can do it. I don't that goes into a whole next thing about night fishing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll, <laughs> gosh, I probably do half my fishing at night anyways. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely some bites around here. You know, you can frog ponds and stuff at night for, for bass, and that's that's not too surprising. I used to enjoy walking around the tidal basin with a jig at night. I would only get a couple bites, but they were usually pretty nice large mouths. So that, that was a fun summertime activity. I used to um, do that before we lived out here. Really? I lived in Annandale. Okay. It was a 15 minute drive. Yeah, yeah, very convenient. I would fish there three, four nights a week. One thing I, I've, I haven't really tried it at night. I would imagine you could probably frog fish just based on the amount of frogs and toads, right? You could probably frog fish the uh, canal at night. I mean, I know you're not really supposed to be there. I, I would imagine that would probably be a pretty good fishery and, and maybe something a little different. I've always wanted to try it, just haven't gotten around to it. But you know, there's, it's quite a pressured fishery during the day, and I wonder if those. I do wonder, sort of out loud, if those fish would be more active at night. But it's hard to say. That's with all the joggers and bikers gone. Definitely, yeah. I mean, there, and, and frankly too, like people tend to forget they really only think that fish are feeding like when they're fishing for them, and in reality, you know, if you present an opportunistic feeder like a largemouth bass with an easy meal, right, they're probably going to take it, whatever time of day it might be. I want to get one of those. It's like a skateboard with a big wheel on it. Okay. I just want to go down the canal and look for fish. I think that would be really cool. Yeah. That or, I mean, I, I've used just like kind of canal cruiser style bikes and used those before just to kind of poke around. When I was working at, at Fletcher's, this was maybe, I want to say fall 2019, 
I, I would just take a bike and just look for bass and snake heads. And maybe not as much looking, but I would just hop from spot to spot. I mean, right. you'd see the carp and the sunfish, but generally those bass and snake heads were kind of kind of in hiding. I mean, you, occasionally you might see a pear or like a fry ball or something like that. But do you know when they're going to fill it up in the canal? And I wish I did. Um, I love fishing in Georgetown. Yeah, and, you know, and, and it's 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 rough. I mean, it's again a whole other topic. You know, the canal was i mean it's the closest thing to almost what i would call like an ada compliant fishery right i mean especially near fletcher's like you could potentially get a wheelchair on there if you really had to and it's tough to see what should be such a you know just a rock star especially a pan fishery right you know something great for kids it's tough to see that bone dry mm -hmm. especially now when i think people are really truly itching to get outside I and mean, maybe not in january but you know certainly come spring you know, there are a lot of kids that, you know, their parents might take them there and they are, they might remember 10 or 15 years ago, right? Oh, it was full of, full of water, full of fish. And that's just not the case. Um, it's, it's unfortunate. I, I would hope, you know, I'd hope they'd fill it in. But I mean, my understanding is it was supposed to be done in 2020. And then lo and behold, there was more work to be done in Georgetown. So it's drained for the foreseeable, it's, unfortunately. I still never gotten a carp on a mulberry. Huh. I don't think I've ever done much of that. Um, I mean, I've caught him in there. I've seen him eating even occasionally, like, the non brood X cicadas because you do get cicadas every right. year and dog days and yeah yeah this but, uh, year's gonna be crazy with the cicadas yeah if they, if they emerge like they say they will i mean i remember what was it 17 years ago 17 is that right years ago yeah. i was teaching high school um, kids were bringing jars of oh in school oh my gosh yeah, they're everywhere yeah. um so yeah that that could be really interesting um i can't say i was fishing much at the time yeah i definitely look forward to that i mean it's something i'd like to try it'd be really cool to get some carp on any sort of topwater imitation or other fish. I mean, even I'd imagine bass and probably even snakeheads would eat them, I would think. Yeah. That much rattle they make on top. Yeah, not that there's much like record of that, but I'd still imagine just an easy opportunistic uh, meal. They're going to take advantage of it. So. Absolutely. I don't think my wife's going to leave the house. That's fine. When they're flying around. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, no, it's, uh, gosh, I, I remember we were, this was a long time ago, we were like watching a dog and the dog would literally eat the cicadas right off the sidewalk and it was just a mess <laughs> thereafter so yeah they're uh and I, I mean gosh i remember gosh this was again 17 years ago it's like i would reach into my pocket and there'd be a cicada like you go outside and they're just everywhere they're in your hood or wherever so two so 17 times two is 30 something whatever so fourth grade is when we had it before that so 1980 something wow. and i would remember fill it up a paper bag with them at lunch and throw it in the girl's bathroom hmm and I'm sure they loved that. Principal's office for the rest of the day. Yeah, <laughs> I would imagine so. I just remember we couldn't ride our bikes. There was there were so many of them. Hmm. Even though Reston had been so much developed by right, then, right. there were still just so much woods around us where they just were untouched, just deafening. Yeah, that is one thing. The noise is actually a it's a bit much. I mean, when they're when they're all sort of calling like that, it's, it's crazy it's brutal. And yeah. then all the tree branches where they lay their eggs, they all die and fall down. So all the tree branches on the side of the roads, the tips of the trees are all going to be dead. Hmm. It's going to be kind of ugly looking. Yeah, I can't say I know too much about their life history, but it's it's going to be interesting for sure, uh, yeah. just in general and also from like a fishing perspective. So. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, night fishing, you ever hear things out there you don't know what they are? I've definitely heard like, you know, you'll hear foxes or coyotes from time to time, and those are probably the most scary, if you want to call it that. Yeah, I will say, so I went to school in Richmond and, you know, you might occasionally hear a gunshot or two, but that, I mean, it was nothing, nothing too surprising for like a major city. So, but that, that that's about the only, the only like different stuff I ever heard. We were out on Burke Lake September at night. Owls everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. They're loud. That's for sure. Any different techniques you use at night? Does color even matter? You know, I really... That's a debate I've had probably a million times with friends, right? I, I really don't think so at night. I mean, I think there are sort of shades of color, but, you know, if it's, and, and maybe it's different on like a full moon, but like say it's a new moon, right? Like I, I can't imagine a fish is going to know whether you're fishing something that's, you know, black or white or yellow or purple. I mean, it's, it's hungry. It doesn't care. Right. I, I think generally, as long as you're matching the profile of whatever those fish might be looking for at the time. Or like you know, topwater fishing, right? They're only they're only ever going to see the bottom of the lure to begin with. So, and at a night, I can't imagine they see anything other than black. So, you know, if you're fishing like a frog at night, you know, I guess black's probably a good place to start. But I don't think it matters too much now. When you hook into one of those big fish, do you ever get scared that it's just going to sleigh ride you somewhere you don't want to go? 
Um, you know, I definitely have a, enough paddling experience. Like when I've been kayak fishing for larger fish, I never have really felt afraid. I mean, you just kind of wear the fish out, land it really quickly and hopefully get a photo with it and release it and kind of send it on its way. I'm trying to think of the, the only times I've ever been like scared hooking a fish would be like if I don't have a good footing and maybe it's in a precarious place. But other than that, I mean, again, that's all stuff you sort of should plan for ahead of time if yeah. you're targeting something that might be larger. What are some of the fish that have surprised you that you've come across at night? Uh, Size-wise, anything different at nighttime? Well, I mean, I, I do I do think there's some truth to like finding larger fish at night. I mean, I, that's just my opinion though. There's no real like data behind that. I would say the the weirdest catch, and I'm sure you're, you remember this one back in 2016, would be like a title Potomac muskie. That was yeah. a, that was a fluke of a catch. I um, probably got five texts that night. That yeah, I mean it was picture. just so absurd to land like not only a muskie in DC, but then you know have it be like a a 40 inch plus fish. Yeah. And you got an award for that. I, I did get a citation. Yeah, that's so a trophy fish certificate. It's really interesting. But you know, I, I released that fish and it hopefully is still out there. Who knows? I mean, I, I can't imagine the title Potomac is great for them once it warms up, so. Yeah, people are all trying to figure out where that was. Everyone's like, you see the light on? What's about the back? Is that a street light? Is that the moon? I, I had people ask and, you know, <laughs> they, they were guessing all over the place. That should have been fun for you. It, it was, it was, a, <laughs> it was a hoot. What but, did the muskie uh, eat? So it actually ate, uh, gosh, it was, I want to say a quarter ounce or maybe like a three eighths ounce jig head, little tiny curly tail grub. And uh, I mean, it, it truly did surprise me because I hooked it and I'm like, oh, that's weird. You know, maybe I snagged something. It didn't fight too hard. I hooked it fair and, you know, it did eat it. And it actually ended up rolling in the line, which is the only reason I ever caught the fish to begin with. Um, rolled in the line and, I mean, it was still obviously, a, there was some mass to it. You know, it was a larger fish. Um, ended up just barely. I was with a good friend of mine. Do, do you know Thomas Kraft by any chance? Thomas Kraft. Does that name ring a bell? I'd have to see some pictures. Okay, he's also pretty active in some of like the local, you know, Facebook groups, stuff like that. Um, good friend of mine, he was with me. You know, he landed that fish. I, I had luckily had a grip of some sort with me at the time. And I think like as he landed it, the line snapped. So, because again, it was only, I want to say 10 pound test. Nothing, you know, that you would ever normally use for, uh, Musky. for muskies yeah. now. So that was, again, that, that was probably the, the weirdest fish and everyone thinks that was a nighttime fish it was actually just before sunrise so it was really dark and then you know it lightened up pretty quickly yeah, there i thought it was two in the morning somewhere yeah yeah um yeah that, that was again that was definitely the weirdest most out of place catch i would say right. for sure do you have a favorite season for fishing locally locally i mean it's it's going to be hard to beat springtime in washington dc i mean you have so many options um, and this is not exactly like a novel thought. You've probably heard this from a million other anglers too, right? I mean, think about it. You have everything from the anadromous, like the migratory species. You have uh, a blossoming snakehead fishery, amongst other things. You have an incredible crappy fishery, largemouth bass, some smallmouth bass, walleye, so on and so forth. I mean, obviously big catfish of all sorts. It, it just goes on and on. Carp. You this know, should be a destination. It, it, yeah, I mean, it's. I've heard this from a few other people and I tend to agree with it sort of labeling it as the premier urban fishery. I mean, in terms of species diversity in the springtime, I, I would I would tend to think, yes. I mean, it is, th there aren't many places where you could potentially catch, say a hickory shad, which is like a saltwater fish. It's coming up here to spawn, right? And then, you know, in the same jurisdiction, you might catch a Northern snakehead, right? From East Asia. I mean, the odds of that anywhere else are probably pretty low. I just love how you're, you're out there and there's just fish plopping and jumping and there's crazy amount of birds. There's helicopters. It's just that's our official bird in Washington yeah. D.C. So. <laughs> I, 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 so I tell people you'll see more fish in a day with me than you've seen in your entire life. When the herring are swimming by, that's yeah. One when, when it comes to the spring stops. run, yeah. I mean, just the sheer biomass, like you're saying. I mean, even if you're like in a waiting spot, I mean, you're just going to see the fish right through your legs. Yeah. It's incredible. Um, and later on, you'll see like gar, like you said, they're two, three, sometimes close to four feet long. I mean. Crazy. Where else, right? I mean, and then uh, there aren't many places. The snakehead snaggers, it's just entertaining to watch that. That is an issue, yeah. Gosh, that's that's a whole other topic. I mean, they, they shouldn't be doing it, as, as we all know, probably everyone listening, you know, snagging hooks are illegal in DC, so don't use them. It, it you know, on one hand, I think, and speaking for myself here, it's like they are considered a non native and in some, some eyes, invasive species. 
that you're only targeting a single fish. It's not right. like you're throwing out a cast net. In, right. in a screw yeah, so I, I suspect, and again, I'm speaking just for myself here, that I suspect there's some sort of like maybe tacit approval of that. There isn't too much enforcement up there from the National Park Service. So um, I, I think because they're, you know, in, in the public's eyes or maybe the, the less informed eyes of certain persons, right? Like they're removing an invasive, that's all they see. And so they probably don't care too much, but um, I'm not a big fan of illegal fishing methods. I mean, I just, you shouldn't do it. That's mm -hmm. really all there is to it. There's some crazy stuff that goes on down there. What's something that you've seen that, that nobody else would believe? Like I saw a guy reel up a cormorant once that he hooked underwater. That does happen. swim across the river. Yeah, I've seen some of that too. Gosh, I'm trying to think, what is the weirdest thing I've seen? It's, it's mind boggling the craziness that goes on around Chain Bridge in the springtime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Chain Bridge, Fletcher's all the way down into the city. I mean, even like Haynes Point, you know, there are there are issues uh, with regard to fishing behavior. Like you said, I mean, you see people swimming in the river, especially at times of year when they definitely shouldn't be. Um, not that it's legal to begin with, right? Occasionally you'll see, and this is something, gosh, you'll, you'll see someone with a bow, even though bow fishing is is illegal in dc so i mean stuff like that you know it's not not great the optics are not good right when you see someone walking around with a bow yeah no weapons in things. the national park yeah generally a good idea I would, I would agree with that so yeah behavior like that not great obviously like the snakehead snagging it's just kind of yeah there, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be worked on and i think will be worked on in the years to come so what's some crazy stuff you've come across you find anything weird see things that are not fishing related other than you know the crazies out at chain bridge um, you know, gosh, I, I, this is not a personal story. I, I do remember I talked to a, this was a, I want to say it was a national park service. So it was us park police. Um, it was an actual law enforcement officer. And I believe, gosh, this was a few years ago. He mentioned that, and this was sort of in the floodplain kind of area near, near little falls. They found just a human skull and just the skull and it, where it came from to this day, they don't know. So that, that was sort of an interesting one. I, I read a report gosh, maybe one or two years ago of like a, you know, someone found like a rusted handgun. You know, I don't want to say it was a Glock that was found like partially rusted out under. Well, then Paula, four years ago, like to right, this weekend. Right. Yeah, yeah. She, she found a bucket and violin case of guns. Yeah, that, that it's it really seemed like that story kind of got memory hold a little bit. Um, as far as I know, she found quite a few firearms and, you know, the police obviously were involved. But they confiscated all of them. And uh, that was sort of the last, I think anyone ever heard of that. Again, not, not great. So. We bumped into her on M Street in Georgetown with a whole bunch of deer antlers one day. Really? My yeah. I was like, who's that woman you're talking to? I'm like, that's Paula. Yeah, Paula is, uh, she's a treasure. I think she does a lot of like the shed hunting and stuff. So she'll find, find the uh, dropped antlers. I don't know where she was going. I don't know either, actually. I mean, I believe, as far as I know, she lives with Gordon over in Arlington. So where do you live? Tyson's Corner area. Okay. So, yeah. So you drive all the way to the city? Well, we're, I mean, for fishing, yes. Um, I mean, work-wise, we're still on telework like most agencies, so. So what is it that you do? I honestly didn't know you had a job until you emailed me about volunteer opportunities, which we can get into for listeners also. Right, right, yep. So I got on board with DOEE, so that's the Department of Energy and Environment, uh, for your listeners, in late April, 2020. My title was Fish and Wildlife Biologist. The work I do is mostly aquatic resource education, right, out of the AREX or the Aquatic Resources Education Center. And then a big part of that, too, is actually angling education, right? So fishing clinics, things like that, kind of coordinating those programs. And again, because of the ongoing pandemic, we haven't been able to do too much of that, you know, the in-person activities and programs. Um, I was fortunate enough to do a few very limited person, you know, mask required sort of fishing clinics uh, this past summer, so summer 2020. There was a tidal basin event? Uh, that was 2019s. So that was, that was mm -hmm. prior to my employment with the DOE. Yeah, we're hoping, and again, it's, it's really tough to sort of predict the future here a little bit, but we're hoping, you know, at, at least in sort of maybe... That was owl. Oh, was it? <laughs> okay. That was a great um, horned owl. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so, so I mean, we're hoping to do at least some smaller clinics, you know, maybe in the spring and, and early summer, and then maybe, again, the, tra the trajectory of this, the, depending on which way it goes, you know, maybe we could do some larger events in, in the latter half of the year. But it's it's so tough to say, just because, I mean, most most agencies so are on telework, kids are still on teleschool, right? Yeah, oh <laughs> I don't know how you're doing it. But, Did uh, you see anyone in there? Hopefully, 
I told my daughter she could dip her fries in NyQuil the other day. Oh, that's... Uh, I was like, I just need you to stop bothering me. Right. You need a tranquilizer, like, from, <laughs> from uh, yeah, so old school. Hoping to get back to, you know, some more regular programming, um, but it's, it's really tough to stay right now. And the boat ramp there, is that free? Yep, yep. So that, that's actually, I believe, that was funded through the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Sport Fish Restoration Fund. Not 100% certain on that. Um, it is free. Anyone can launch there. Um, it's on my list. I've never been up to Anacostia. So I haven't been to the Kenilworth Gardens. I actually, so I've been there on foot. I haven't paddled up there. I have paddled from that launch near the AREC, that ramp. And I believe it's actually, so it's interesting. It was paid for by Fish and Wildlife Service funds, I believe. And then it's actually maintained by the National Park Service because it's within Anacostia Park. So that's sort of an interesting little thing there. But I have paddled up from that ramp to not quite Kenilworth or anything like that, but you know, Kingman and Heritage Islands. I, I will say, I mean, it looks incredible for snakeheads. I haven't gotten one there. It's not to say they're not there. Really, it's just a beautiful stretch of river. I mean, it's hard to like, when everyone thinks of the Anacostia, they think of like trash and all that, right? And in reality, it's a beautiful stretch of river. Yeah. And you're still well within DC too. So um, yeah, that's, if, if you get the chance, I mean, definitely it's, it's worth launching there and, and exploring there a little bit. Gunboats going up and down that this week. I know they're closing everything off for the inauguration. Yeah, that's really interesting. So my understanding is uh, from, I want to say Key Bridge to Woodrow Wilson Bridge. And, and there are like different sectors, but that stretch is closed to boat traffic, at least right now and through the inauguration, I believe. And then also a portion of the Anacostia up to, I'm not quite sure which bridge I'd have to look again, but a, a good portion of the tidal Anacostia is closed as well. So fingers crossed everything goes smoothly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I sure hope so. What fish have you yet to catch? Gosh, it's on your list. So one if, that, you're a biologist, you know some some odd fishes out there. <laughs> I, I would say I do. Um, one fish that has eluded me, not that I've put in enough time to really justify saying this, but one fish that has eluded me is, is red drum, like like larger, you know, they call them bull reds. Or, mm -hmm. And that's one thing I would like to catch, one species I would like to catch at some point. You know, I've, I've kayak fished for them towards the mouth of the bay. I've seen some extraordinary fish caught. I just haven't put in the time. So that's something I would like to catch in you know, 2021 and beyond. Um, other than that, um, I would like to get maybe back into a more regular uh, snakehead schedule. I kind of, I, I didn't fish for them as hard as maybe I should have in, in 2020. So that's something I'd like to get back into. I mean, they're such a, such an interesting fish. I mean, when you think about it, right, tidal Potomac, like you could potentially catch a 10 pound snakehead every time you go out. Not that that's going to happen, but you have a shot at it. Like what other fishery can you catch on light tackle a top water 10 pound fish right or, or have have the chances of doing so on a regular basis i mean i can't you know you're not going to catch a 10 pound large mouth every time that's for sure so and you get a walk have you ever seen them jump the rocks like salmon in the springtime watching them migrate is just bonkers yeah yeah so in that scenario as far as i know they're not feeding um and again i'm, I'm parroting some of the work of other biologists here but my understanding is for the sake of argument 25 percent of the the whole population in the tidal Potomac, and they do this on the Occoquan too, actually up to the dam there, will push up. That is not their spawning grounds by any stretch. I mean, they're not necessarily like broadcast There's spawning. No exactly. Beds up that way. Yeah, it's it's a like Chain Bridge. It's fifty feet deep. Yeah, in spots. It, it's 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 not um, as far as I know is like spawning grounds to them. I mean, they just want to repopulate other right, areas. Right. I mean, when you think about like non-native or invasive species behavior, right? I mean, that's what they're going to do. They're going to push up to the next barrier or whatever that might be. Interestingly, I mean, they do push up every year. Uh, there's quite that popular uh, fishery for them, if you want to call it that. But I, as far as I know, they don't, you know, I've never actually never seen one above Little Falls. Um, sort of in that stretch between Little Falls and Great Falls. That's not to say they don't make it up there. I'm sure some do, but really, I've never heard of one being caught. Right, right. I mean, that's really not their preferred habitat, right? Um, sort of like the, the free flowing mm -hmm. uh, part of the Potomac, portion of the Potomac. You know, when you think of when you think of northern snakeheads, you think of sort of these these static Water. backwaters. You know, you think of uh, spatter dock and lily pads and hydrilla and all that milfoil. You don't think of smallmouth water. <laughs> that's for sure. I mean, again, I. Are there some up there? I'm sure. I mean, they're certainly in the canal pretty far up, but that's also a byproduct of they're unlawful well, stocking. So, Do you do Burke Lake at all? They're all up in those weeds. Yeah, it's really interesting. I fished there once with a good friend of mine who a uh, kid I actually went to high school with, and he kind of reached out to me. He had gotten into snakehead fishing. I went there, I want to say, one time this summer, and 
I mean, unfortunately, I, I didn't realize this until after the fact. One of the hook points, I, I had a, a hollow body frog with two hooks, right? And one of the hook points was bent out. So I, I ended up missing a lot of fish. But I mean, I probably had like seven or eight blow ups at least. Ended up catching like two of them, you know, little eaters. But a friend, my friend who actually had reached out to me, you know, he was catching them. And again, he was pretty new to the sport. You know, he was catching fish pre spawn up to seven or eight pounds or so um, out of Brick Lake. So they're, they're definitely in there. They'll sit in three inches of water. You'll scare them when you're on the trail. Right, right. They don't need much. Um, gosh, they've, they've, as far as I know, they've been in there for probably five years or more. So the chances are there are some, some rather large ones. Oh, Jim, in Jim caught one this year, like, I mean, like a good three feet. And it was a crazy hmm. windy day. I could not keep my boat still even we, were, we found one little cove okay because that used to be that's where dallas airport was gonna be built right right it's about 220 acres 280 you look at so. it it's, it's long and it's got like two offshoots where the other runways right. would be right yeah I, I have read that yeah i mean it's, it's really what, what an intro i mean i don't fish it much but i mean in terms of species diversity you could catch anything from pickerel to musky to obviously snakeheads Wallace, largemouth snakehead, walleye carp. yeah they, they tag the walleye in there in yeah there. we went because yeah. my Boat's got lights on it. You okay. can see them in the shallows at night. Wow. It's so gross. That's a place, honestly, again, if you wanted to avoid the pressure, like that would be a place to try night fishing, which you actually can do. I mean, there is a 24-7. We the, yeah, we were the last ones out. And yeah. then we were having issues between the troll. I was using the trolling motor with okay. the same battery as my lights. Okay. And they just didn't want to play long. Right, right. So we had to choose one or the other. We yeah. chose trolling motor and went by the moon. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting fishery. If I lived closer, I probably would fish it more. It's kind of it's a little to me. It feels out of the way. I'm so used to sort of fishing, fishing DC and fishing, you know, the river. Yeah. Definitely a place I want to fish more. I, I would think, and this is generally true in my experience, like pond and lake snakeheads are probably easier to catch than like tidal fish. You know, when you go down to like South Florida, right? Those canal bullseye snakeheads, different species. Uh, you can. Yeah, you could potentially catch six, seven, eight, or more of them in a day, and that wouldn't be too surprising to anyone. Whereas here, if you had a day like that, you know, you might be fishing some really good water, but generally speaking, most spots are pressured enough where you know, one or two is a little bit better of a day than. A year ago, I was planning our trip, driving to Florida to fish the canals and right. then the Keys and the COVID. Yeah, that's what I would do to go down to Florida just to live out of my car for a week and fish. I'm half tempted to do that. I've, I've been really. Pretty strict, you know, I, I haven't traveled at all out of the DMV. And it's one of those things at this point, you know, I, I think if, if I do go, it would just be driving down, like you said, out of my own vehicle. What do you drive? Uh, vehicle? Yes. I have a Lexus, it's an older Lexus. Uh, you could put a kayak on it? I could, yeah. Honestly, most of the most of the canals you really don't need. I mean, that's the beauty of, I mean, that's why anyone down there is, is pro staff for a million companies, right? Because you can walk any drainage ditch and you can catch uh, I mean, anything from bullseye snakeheads, peacock bass, clown um, knife fish, clown knife fish ja jag jaguar, fish. guapodis. Uh, oh yeah, gosh. exactly. Yeah, I believe they're, I want to say sleeping or walking catfish. I can't remember off the top of my head. It just goes on and on. Is and pros tap how people get Shimano jackets? No, this was $6 on sale on a uh, clearance rack. But, uh, you know, we have the Dick's warehouse right here. Really? It's apparently like dirt cheap. I have not been in because I don't know what it would do to me. Right, right. But yeah, we have a Dick's Warehouse where Best Buy used to be. Huh. Everything's on clearance. I'll have to it's check on that out It's on clearance from being on clearance. Right, right, right. So it's just the the bargain barrel then? Or? And then the neighbors are like, we fill up trash bags there. Really? Yeah. Wow, that's worth looking into. I'm definitely a big fan of, uh, you know, I, I try to buy wholesale whatever I buy. So like when I stock up on like soft plastics, I'm buying them 100 at a time. Um, so I'm a big fan of bargains wherever i can find them you got those boots at unique that i found oh yeah i saw that and i was like i'm gonna try it they were they totally fell apart so you, oh, you, no. you dodged a bullet i was like why not right they were not great but uh, <laughs> it still is pretty cool to find it was cool very cool yeah because they were like patagonia yeah yeah they were they were actually they probably were nice boots at one point i get a lot of fly fishing books there too really i've just not, i've been there once since covid started i needed something I so loaded really, up like Pyrex. Yeah, really, really cool place. I used to go there a lot when I was younger just because, like, you'd walk around and just anything that someone was trying to get rid of, right? Yeah. I mean, it would be there. There's a huge love sack in the house we got there. We really? just got a new cover for it. Wow. It's like an $800 sofa. Yeah. It's 11 yeah. bucks. That's wild. Yeah, there's so much. I got my daughter some really cool Texas or Mexican handmade cowgirl boots last year. Hmm. They have, like, sewn in, they're embroidered. Wow. She won't wear them. Oh. But they're cool. She did. 
That would be very cool. She doesn't yeah. wear shoes anywhere because she's stuck inside all the time. Right, right. Yeah, that's it's got to be tough. Yes. What about places you want to travel to fish? Not just the species for redfish. Are there destinations? Would you want to go to Texas Gulf Coast? Yeah, gosh. I mean, I, I really, I, I did not. I mean, like, like I've been saying, I, I haven't traveled hardly at all in the past year or so. So, yeah, I, I would like to definitely spend a little more time in South Florida. Probably some time, some time in Texas, too. I mean, alligator gar, definitely a bucket list fish at some point. Never gotten around to that. Um, I have a friend who's gotten some rather large ones. Uh, are you familiar with Josh Dolan by any chance? Do you know him? He's a Richmond angler. If I see their names, I'll know them. Okay. Um, names are written down. I'll be like, oh, that person. Yeah. But hearing it. Josh was, like, was a, another great influence on me. Good, good friend uh, when I was in school at VCU down in Richmond. He has done some trips there and kayak fish for them, too, and caught them certainly into the 100 plus pound range. So that, that would be a cool trip with regards to South Florida. You know, again, just all of the exotics, everything like like we were talking about. I mean, peacock bass, and they actually have like I believe different species of peacock bass down there. So like, there is sort of I don't know the genus off the top of my head, but there are like four or five plus species. Uh, like there are butterfly peacocks and so on and so forth. And so there are a few down there that would be really cool. Obviously, the bullseye snakeheads. I mean, again, where else? Not they're not as big. They're usually long, but not as they're long and slender looking. Right, right. I mean, I caught one that was thirty two inches and like seven pounds. So, like more eel shaped kind of yeah they're a really spooky looking fish but they do have a really cool pattern when they're especially when they're spawning kind of that orange-ish and then they have the bullseye on the tail as the what's name what's the mouth look like on them just like a northern snakehead a little smaller you ever have one try to bite you not i mean <laughs> not in any situation where i didn't have it coming i mean you know if i'm trying to remove a hook from their mouth yeah they might bite down but i've never never had one like lunge at me or anything. i'm scared that they're gonna do that no you know they're they're really interesting. Like you can actually catch if you play them right, northern snakeheads and, and bullseyes too. If you play them correctly, because they are sort of explosive fish, you can catch them on very light line. Um, not that I would recommend it, right? Because generally you're going to catch them in pretty, pretty thick cover, right? But their teeth, as far as I know, and as far as I've experienced, you know, they're really more so for like kind of graspy, not for slicing. Yeah, they're, they're not. They're not like the teeth of say a muskie, right? Where they would just clean slice your line off, right? Like if you hooked. A northern snakehead, for example, in open water, you could probably catch one on six pound test and not break it off, assuming you played it correctly. So obviously, if you have if it's a lockdown drag, you're just going to break it off, right? But um, their teeth, I mean, sure, they'll pop the fish, right? Like if they're eating a bluegill or a killifish or perch, something like that. But they're not, the, the teeth, as far, again, as far as I've experienced, I mean, they will mess you up if you reach in there, right? They do have obviously strong jaw strength, but they're not, they're not going to slice, in my experience. Smells like my neighbor's cooking on my Traeger. Hmm. I smell food. I do smell uh, burgers on the grill, perhaps. Yeah. Where's that coming from? Follow that. Any other secrets that we should know about? Hmm. Words of wisdom that you've been given that worked? I mean, really the most important thing in fishing, like if you really are seriously into it, right? It's just keep a logbook. That will probably help you the most, more so than anything else. Again, that's, that's sort of a sort of a general statement, but it holds true, right? Um, you know, and the other thing too is just just fish. I mean, learn learn the tides, learn the moon phases, right? Fish at night, fish during the day, fish whenever and wherever you can, and then sort of try to try to understand why it all worked out or why it didn't work out. And, and then one other thing too, I mean, use, use quality gear, whether you're fly fishing, spin fishing, right? Whether you're fishing with bait for catfish, I mean, use quality gear because at the end of the day, if you're going to put in the time, you might as well spend a few extra dollars laying that fish, whatever it might be. I mean, there's no reason to use what I would consider sort of like subpar or like inferior gear. I mean, where do you procure your equipment? Um, I, I do get a lot of stuff um, through district angling. I was there yesterday, I actually ordered some reels, a wading jacket. Um, yeah, so R Richie's great about that. I mean, you obviously know him pretty well. I'm district angling over in, in Arlington. I do order things online in bulk too. So like if I'm ordering like soft plastics, I do have some companies I order from in bulk um, just because I know, like I know which colors I want to use. I know what size is all that. Generally speaking, mid to high grade, like Shimano reels, like I'm mostly a spin fisherman, right? So that's that's generally what I'm using. Generally one piece graphite rods, um, what, you know, for, for the right species, of course, too. Yeah, yeah that, that's really that. And gosh, I probably go through I don't even want to know how many yards of light braid every year, right? So 
anywhere from six to ten pound test braid. I mean, you can catch most most species in the Potomac six to ten pound braid, and then whatever appropriate leader you need. Um, what do you cut your braid with? Just whatever scissors or clippers I have on hand. I actually just you know it's like every year I I burn through tackle right. I burn through gear. Things rust out. They break. I mean, I'm, I'm hard on the stuff I use. So I'll re up, right? And I like just the other day ordered a pretty high end pair of pliers um, with a good, I, I want to say it was like a carbide line cutter and everything, stuff like that. So I'm a big fan. Um, it's a little tool. It's like $10, I think, on Amazon, I want to say. The boomerang line yeah. cutter. Those things, honestly, if, if you had like one convenient tool, I, I would say that and like a cheap pair of, you know, hemostats or something. Don't leave the, the forks open on it when you're shooting line. I oh, had a line okay. go across it. I just watched my line. It just kept going across the river. And I'm, what, what's going on? And then I looked down and there's just completely severed line. That thing is super sharp. Definitely, definitely. I mean, it goes through pretty high test braid too, no problem. Yeah. And uh, I mean, luckily it locks shut. That's convenient because, like you said, I mean, it'll it'll cut through just about any line. So yeah, love those. Just, just got another pair of them. <laughs> Not affiliated, but I do really like them. Um, I think it was actually Alex that introduced me to them. So yeah, really love that tool. Yeah, good pliers, good gear. Sunglasses? Um, I was big into Costas for a long time, still am. I just uh, <laughs> had a spate of bad luck and I lost a couple pairs in the last or no. year or two, which is pretty tragic. I, I think the first pair I had, I had for like six years and I donated them to the river at some point. And then I bought another pair, and you're going to laugh, I was pawpaw picking, of all things, and fell off my head. So I just haven't uh, bitten the bullet yet and bought another pair. But uh, I probably should do that soon. So Probably get a discount through work, right? Honestly, yeah. I probably should look through <laughs> like my vision plan, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, Costas, Costas are great. That's generally what I, what I use, and most, you know, most people around here I know use them. They're, they're just, they work. There's really no other way to put it. When you're not night fishing, how do you protect against the sun? Um, you know, you should wear the right layers. I really do like, you know, like sun, I mean, sunscreen, first and foremost, you should wear that, right? If you're going to be in the sun for a prolonged period. I can't say I've done that as much as I should have. That's probably true for everyone though. Um, I do like sort of the, the lightweight, kind of like the sun shirts they make a lot of, it doesn't have to be like Columbia PFG, but they're, they're sort of, when you think of that, you think of Columbia, right? Or, or Sims, um, do have some nice Sim stuff for that too. Um, yeah. The sun is no joke. I mean, I'm sure you've heard that before oh, yeah. on this podcast too, There's, but see how my watch tan is this time of year. It's not, no, it's gone away. I used to have a, a Costa tan where, I mean, it was like raccoon eyes, you know? And I mean, even going back like behind the ear, although this, again, this is the longest hair you'll see anytime soon. But um, yeah, I mean, especially when I was working outside all summer long, it's like, I, I would be a totally different shade. I mean, right now I feel almost translucent, right? But yeah. Definitely, definitely got to wear the sunglasses and the, the hat. I mean, obviously wear a hat, wear any sort of sun gear you can, um, because again, it's not a joke. Any superstitions when you're fishing? I try to avoid bananas. I mean, I know everyone says that, like bananas on the boat. I don't really know the background behind that, but I try to avoid it for whatever reason. I don't know if it makes a difference. Don't want to jinx myself, so knock on wood there. But uh, I'm trying to think what else. I do believe in like fishing karma for sure, right? So. I try to help people out when and where I can, like, especially if I see, you Rods know, upside down. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that, you know, or like you see like a younger angler. I mean, that you, you should, you Always should help the kid. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's, there is like a universal karma, right? I'm not the most spiritual person, but I do believe, and I can honestly say like, there have been so many times, I'm sure it's pure coincidence, right? But like, you help somebody out and then like later that day, you catch just a, a stud of a fish, whatever you're going for. So definitely, in terms of like kind of superstitions or like karma, yeah, definitely help people out when and where you can. And especially around here, you don't know who you're gonna run into. Um, and it, you know, it could be a potentially very important person too. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely help people the out. The important people don't dress like they're important. You'll that is the beauty people, of it, yeah. yeah. You have no idea, you're like, wait a second. That's what, wait, but on TV, you're wearing makeup and a suit and your hair's done. And then you see them out and you're like, flip flops, jeans with holes in them. Yeah. Fishing is sort of the great equalizer. Again, I'm sure that's been said before. Um, to paraphrase, I, I want to I say it was Mike Bailey that said this. It's like anyone at Fletcher's in the springtime can throw on a hoodie, right? A sweatshirt, and you won't know who they are, but they might be They might be a movie star. They might be a Supreme Court justice. You yeah. just don't know. Um, so that's, I mean, in terms of like a cool place to meet potentially like VIPs, right? 
I mean, that, that's the place to go yep. in, in D.C. in the springtime, for sure. Washington Post said Fletcher's Cove is the best fishing hole in the country. I, I would tend to agree with that. Uh, was that like an old Angus Phillips article or something? Ten years or? ago, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I mean, again, like there just aren't many places where you can catch so many different fish, but also fish of quality, right? You're not, you're not just talking about like bluegill or something, right? Surely you could catch those too, but... It's quality, also, quantity, and diversity. And, and also just scenery too. I mean, sure, sure, the helicopters and planes are a little loud, but that's also part of the scene. You know, it's like you might see Marine One flying down mm -hmm. in, in the group of three down the helicopter or, or down the river rather in group of three helicopters. Obviously, bald eagles and herons and cormorants and osprey and all that. So I mean, yeah, it's it's one of the kind. I swans. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I even gosh, in the so it's probably sort of mid to late summer months. You'll see like great egrets and obviously great blue herons are there by springtime. Um, some interesting birds too. The I terns did, are loud. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just all sorts of, of um, avian life amongst other things. It's just a really, really cool place. There's ravens down that way too. The only nesting pair in DC, I believe. Is yeah, DC. I heard there was like one pair sighted. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not necessarily an avian specialist, but yeah, that's that rings a bell. Anything else I didn't ask you that you want to tell the world? Do you want to say hi to anybody? Uh, no, nothing off the top of my head. No, I can't say, but um, glad to be on here. I mean, this this was a few years in the making, I Absolutely. would say. <laughs> and then we'll have to get you on the boat sometime this summer. I want to. We're going to put all this to use. Yeah, that would be a fun time for yeah. sure. Um, maybe uh, maybe a snakehead mission or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming out to Fairfax. It wasn't too far. Yeah, thank you for having me. Your ride home. You can stop at Wawa on the way back. Okay, yeah. I think I we, should have uh, had you stop on the way here and get me a sandwich. Right, right. Yeah, those are great. We don't have too many of those right where I am. That's, that's it. I mean, we drive from here on Fridays to go get hoagies there. Really? Okay. Her lunch is 95 minutes long. What am I supposed to do every day? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, oh my that's quite the lunch break there. Crazy. I, truly, I don't know how you're doing it. I mean, it's it's got to be tough. I'm, I'm thankful I'm actually right in the age group that I'm in right now. It's yeah. worked out well, for sure. <sighs> But, uh, Where can people find you on the Instagram? My handle is just uh, at Chris Campo Fishing, all one word, lowercase, lower score. Yeah, that's really where I'm most active. All right. Where are you fishing next? Gosh, this time of year, I don't have much planned. I, I think I might be doing a musky float soon. So perhaps the Upper Potomac. Very cool. Um, that's Water's low and clear right now. Yeah, th this would be the time if you were going to give it a go. Yeah. So. All right, well, thanks for coming out. All righty, thank you. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com. This podcast is brought to you by Freestone Productions at freestoneproductions.com.